Welcome to It's All Your Fault on True Story FM, the one and only podcast dedicated to helping you identify and deal with the most challenging human interactions, those with someone who may have a high conflict personality. I'm Megan Hunter, and I'm here with my co-host, Bill Eddy. Hi, everybody. We're the co-founders of the High Conflict Institute in San Diego, California. In this episode, we're joined for part two by a special guest, Amanda Smith, who will discuss her specialty, borderline personality disorder. In part one, we focused on um, helping the person who may be struggling with BPD or thinks they may have BPD. So it's really good information in there. In this episode, we'll focus on how family members can best help their loved one who struggles with BPD and how they can help themselves, which is very, very important. So you'll want to listen to this episode if you have a family member uh, who may struggle with BPD. But first, a couple of notes. If you have a question about high conflict situations or about BPD, send them to podcast at highconflictinstitute.com or submit them on our website at highconflictinstitute.com slash podcast, where you'll also find the show notes and links for today's episode. Please give us a rate or review and tell your friends, colleagues, or family about us, especially if they're dealing with a high conflict situation. We are very grateful. Now let's talk borderline personality disorder for family members. So welcome, Amanda. Um, We're here to just learn all we can from you. Uh, So I guess I'll start it off with what is the kind of primary reaction of people, uh, family members with someone who gets a diagnosis? I think there's often a lot of fear, worry. I think that for parents, there's sometimes some blame. Parents often blame themselves, or sometimes parents blame the other parent um, and say, well, this is this came from from this side of the family, not my side of the family, but this side of the family. That's um, a pretty common reaction um, in some families I've worked with. Um, but yeah, I think I think people often feel worried, often think, okay, well, what what's gonna happen now and what's going to happen in the future? Um, you know, what, what will this mean for this individual and for our family as a whole? But I guess one of the things I want to talk about is when they're not diagnosed, but you see this pattern of behavior and family members are very frustrated because they're being blamed for things that you know, explosive rage because you forgot to mention, you know, you forgot to tell me to pick that up at the store. And here I'm back at the store and you're just outraged that I didn't pick up that thing that you didn't make clear you wanted. Uh, how how should family members deal with someone with this kind of blaming, rageful, disproportionate um, response to things? I think one of the most important things for family members to remember is that they are not the cause of their loved one's suffering, their loved one's emotional pain. Even if there's a genetic component, I would hate for any family member to blame themselves and to say, oh, well, this is this is my fault or this is how I I failed my child or this is how I failed my my spouse or my partner. I think that it's pretty common for all of us when someone, again, is lashing out at us, we take the behavior pretty personally. And that may either mean that we get really defensive Or sometimes we take on all of the blame, all of the responsibility and say, well, I must have I must have done something. So now I have to figure out what I need to avoid doing in the future so that we avoid these outbursts or these problems. And I don't know necessarily that either approach is is necessarily helpful. It's one thing to think, okay, well, I said this in a particular way and I can see where this anger comes from. Um, but it's not necessarily helpful when we think about creating healthier relationships. 
So I would, I just want to, um, when I'm working with families, I just want them to kind of pay attention to those patterns that again, play out in all of our relationships and thinking, okay, am I, am I taking this all on in this moment? Am I, am I imagining that I'm fully responsible for what's happening? Or am I that person in the family who gets really defensive and argues back, fights back, or kind of even shuts down, you know? So I think even just beginning to be aware of those patterns and the things that we do in our relationships is a first step to potentially making some really positive and helpful changes in our lives. Now, one thing that happens for family members is they they uh, reach reach a saturation point and want to set limits. Let's say with uh, an older adolescent or young adult, and they wonder, should I just kick them out? You know, or what do I do when they're just there's so all this rage, et cetera, that's so inappropriate. And and we know that they have a problem, but they don't agree that they have a problem. How how do you help people with that? I think it's important for family members to think about safety. And that doesn't mean just physical safety, but I think about emotional safety, um, feeling safe in the relationship. If the other person is not accepting help that's available to them and the relationship feels untenable and unsafe, I sometimes think it's absolutely appropriate to think about creating, I think Marsha Linehan would, would talk about creating a family vacation. You know, we're taking a vacation apart from each other for a specific period of time or until something something changes, something's different. That's not the same as abandonment or throwing up our hands and saying nothing's ever going to be different, so we're just giving up on this relationship. But I think it can sometimes be very healthy for family members to say, you know, I'm, I, we need to separate, at least temporarily, again, especially when relationships feel potentially dangerous and, and unsustainable. Yeah. What's that look like in like in this in the marital relationship, uh, like the family vacation? Right. I, I, I mean, I've worked with families where, you know, again, and, and it's it's so helpful when when people are on the same page and, and boy, is that hard to do. So I, I just want to recognize that. But many years ago, I worked with a wonderful, wonderful couple and um, the husband was in treatment with me. He was doing really well in DBT and yet things at home were still really challenging, really challenging. And so we had a very honest discussion about a temporary separation. And I think the separation lasted, I think it was just about 90 days. Um, and it's actually something that proved to be um, kind of a reset for the entire family. Um, and they still met every single day for dinner. Um, but it was a brief 90 minute, two hour interaction. And the husband was getting lots of really good support and encouragement and, and also was working with someone when it came to getting some additional parenting skills and parenting training. But I, I think this can absolutely work. In, in, for couples and families. But again, it starts with an honest conversation about what's working and what's not working. And then the willingness to try something different to say, okay, well, what would it look like if, again, it's not, um, a separation that takes place, um, indefinitely, but what if we took a 30 day break or a 60 day break and, just to kind of do an assessment and see again what's working and what's not can be can be helpful. Great idea. Now sometimes I'll have someone I consult with and they'll explain pattern that sounds like borderline personality disorder to me. And they'll say, I'm trying to decide whether to get divorced or try to make it work. And I often recommend, well, try to get the person to go to couples counseling with you. But then 
They go to couples counseling, and the counselor agrees with the person with borderline traits that it's all the other person's fault after all, because they're very blaming. It's what I call a persuasive blamer. And and the person calls me back and you say, well, that didn't work because now it's all my fault and that's the problem. It's not all my fault. <laughs> any any thoughts of what I should tell people or what you you would tell people about couples counseling? I I think couples counseling is wonderful, and at the same time, yes, what what you've just described happens pretty frequently. Sometimes I think it's beneficial for couples to have separate therapists and then someone working with the couple together, but each, you know, each spouse or each partner has that separate therapist. I think that that can be sometimes really helpful for couples. Um, and again, having those honest conversations, because this is pretty common in couples work where one therapist, you know, the couple goes and they agree, okay, we're going to try to work this out together. And it feels like the therapist may be taking sides or one partner just, again, walks away feeling blamed or feeling um, like, you know, like, oh, I'm, I'm showing up, I'm trying, and it, it's just not coming together. I know is a really pretty common dynamic when it comes to couples work. So it's a risk, unfortunately, you know. Let me add to that. So let's say a family realizes that someone has borderline traits, but the person's angry, resistant, etc. Is there starting to be interventions like there are with substance abuse treatment? Is there starting to be interventions for borderline treatment, like getting people into DBT, maybe even into a hospital DBT program for severe borderline behavior? Oh, I don't know of anything. Although I find the idea to be really interesting. I, I think about for for most people, and I think this is true for individuals with a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder, and again, also narcissism, um, there's usually a tremendous amount of shame that that person has, um, has been experiencing for a very long time. So I think interventions can feel often very threatening. Um, those ultimatums aren't necessarily effective for most people. But yes, I think there's definitely room to, again, have those honest conversations about what is not working in relationships or in families and to um, then to come to a place where maybe we say, you know what, if, if things things don't change, then, you know, here, here's what we're going to do next. Not that these are ever decisions that we make lightly, but to think about that follow through instead of thinking, you know, like, okay, well now the person has said no. So maybe now we get this another three months or six months or five years. Um, and then we just continue the patterns, which is really heartbreaking to see. I, I don't want to see any families um, break up forever and ever. And yet sometimes we know that that, um, again, what I'll call a vacation, um, can help people decide, no, I do want to go into treatment or I do want to get help or I want to I want to figure out how to make this relationship work. And if that's the result, then, well, maybe maybe that's OK. So it, would it be helpful if if a family member said to their loved one, um, you have borderline personality disorder? I'm pretty sure you do. Is that a good idea? <laughs> Probably not. Although there, there are exceptions. There are exceptions. I definitely worked with clients who were genuinely curious about their own emotional health and why they were really confused about why it was hard to get along with other people and why there were all of these misunderstandings and broken relationships. And then sometimes there's an opportunity for a family member to say, you know, I've been reading about this thing called borderline personality disorder. 
And then if we can give the other person some information that, again, is non-stigmatizing, non-judgmental, um, supportive, encouraging, it's not impossible to imagine that someone might say, oh, okay, this actually does, does describe me. I'm glad, I'm glad you gave me this information. That's, that's how actually been the story for many, many of my clients. Um, and I want to also caution families that that may also be met with defensiveness and hurt feelings and some broken trust as well. So maybe if a family member could approach it with a lot of validation, a lot of empathy, and, uh, and, and no, you know, no judgment, no shame, no blame. It's, it's probably the best, best way in. And, and, you know, something I've seen work also is to, to say, look, I struggle with my own emotions. I may struggle, you know, have these different things that I deal with and I, I want to help get help with them too, or I have gotten help with them. And, and you've seen that change. Um, do you think that's a, a, a good way to do it to kind of put yourself along, uh, kind of beside them? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I've seen so many times where family members are stronger when they learn the skills together and make that commitment. Um, so it's not, Hey, you need help. I'm okay. It's, Hey, both of us need help or we need help as a family can be, um, a great way to role model emotional health and healthy, um, seeking help, I, I think is really important. So yeah, so absolutely. Yes. To normalizing, we all need help at some point in our lives, even if it's, even if it's for a brief period in our lives, like it's okay to need help. And if that message is coming from a family member or a friend, I think that's terrific. Yeah, I think a lot of families get it backwards where they just say, oh, this person's the problem. This is the black sheep and uh, they need help. But it's really a whole system, family system that needs to get help together. Oh, I think it is. Absolutely. I agree. One of the dynamics, and I, I keep coming at this from the perspective of high conflict divorce cases, because there seem to be so many people with borderline personalities or traits involved. But one of the issues is alienation or resistance or refusal to see the other parent in a separation or divorce, which often seems to be associated with a parent with borderline personality traits. And it seems to me pretty clear from studying this for 40 years is that the emotion dysregulation um, just passes through lack of emotional boundaries, really passes to the child. The child absorbs one parent, whether it's mom or dad's anger towards the other parent, their hurt, their sadness, all of that, and can't emotionally tolerate it. And so they go, okay, calm down, mom, or calm down, dad, I'll totally agree with you. And this isn't even a conscious process, but often happens between about nine and 13. And to resolve this in family court takes pointing out all those bad behaviors, which sadly builds resistance to change. And I just didn't know if this is an area that, that you have any thoughts on how to help people be more aware of how they impact the children without having to be so blaming and angry and court focused to get something to happen. That absolutely makes sense. And, and my hope is that when people begin to identify coping skills that help them, that tendency to blame and criticize and judge and attack really, really does diminish. We, ha we have a really big issue in making assumptions that people know what to do. People know how to take care of themselves. People know how to sue themselves. People know how to, um, to talk to themselves in a, in a validating, kind, um, generous way. So instead of, again, it's, you're right. It's so tempting to say, well, just stop doing that. 
stop doing that. <laughs> no, right. And and yet I think that um that recognizing that problem really does start with helping the person help themselves so that they can then tolerate it when someone says, "Hey, you know, you're really really, you know, attacking this person." And again, remember what we talked about, everyone's doing the best that they can. You know, and in getting back to that, that's a really hard message. When someone's been in the habit of blaming others and attacking others for a very long time, even imagining that another person is doing the best that they can can be incredibly painful. But I think if we have that foundation of self-care, coping skills, mindful awareness, that 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 my my hope is that that helps um, reduce that those attacks and that defensiveness and that meanness. That's my hope. What I hear you saying is family members and even professionals may need to set limits, but do it with kindness, empathy. Well, we like to say empathy, attention, and respect. Ear statements that that that's. Uh, fair to do and also maybe more motivating for change than harsh criticism. Absolutely. And the reality is that there are still consequences to our behaviors. Yeah. Whether we have coping skills or we don't have coping skills, there are still consequences to our behaviors, real world consequences. Um, so I think that's also part of having um, or beginning to have that discussion in in treatment is like, yeah, you know, sometimes we say or do things we regret and we're still responsible for those outcomes, those consequences, even in that moment. I think when we have really good coping skills and we're taking extra good care of ourselves, we have a lot less to apologize for at the end of the day or a lot less, a lot fewer messes to clean up when it comes to our relationships. So again, it's, it's, Yes, we want people to do their very best and not not expect people to do things they cannot do. Also, again, the reality of we're still responsible for our own behavior at the end of the day. Excellent. Thank you. Indeed. Um, does medication help? I guess if I were a family member, particularly in in you know, in connection with mental illness, people think that it's just kind of an automatic assumption that they just need a pill. Right. <laughs> so do you want to give a quick uh, one, two on, on the medication front for BPD? I think that medication can be helpful in managing some symptoms, um, sometimes related to depression or anxiety. There is no medication to treat borderline personality disorder. I really caution my clients and their family members from imagining that um, a particular medication or a combination of medications is going to help them to manage every unwanted emotion or thought. I have not found that that's true, um, but sometimes my clients think, well, yeah, if I if I find just the right medication at just the right dose, I'm going to like myself and I'm going to like other people and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be able to work and and go to school. And again, I just I haven't found that that's um, that's true. I think medication can be beneficial, but boy, I, I wouldn't want anyone to to think medication is it. Maybe it's best for the short term and not a, a long term of this pill's going to fix it and they just stay on it forever. It's it's really that uh, everything you've been talking about, the learning skills and, you know, emotion regulation and the things that you'll learn in, in, in treatment or your loved one would. So let's talk about your book, um, The Borderline Personality Disorder, Wellness Planner for Families. Uh, we talked about the dialectical behavior therapy wellness planner, which is for the person struggling with BPD, but this one is specifically for families. So let's, uh, it's a little bit of a different structure, right? Where the, the DBT planner is, is daily and this planner is weekly. Correct. Yes. So, um, this is, like you said, a weekly planner 
with um, a, a very short kind of meditation to read, um, some ideas on recovery and wellness and getting better. And then on a separate page, there's a checklist a ways in which family members can think about self-care, think about how they are honoring their values, Think about setting limitations, following through with limitations in their lives. I believe with this, with all my heart, I want family members to take care of themselves. I think that is so incredibly important. So many times I see family members neglect their own emotional health or their own physical health, their own spiritual health. I want for family members to give themselves permission to prioritize their health. And my hope is that this wellness planner for families helps people give themselves some structure around that self-care. I love it. And it's just so helpful and necessary. And uh, like the other book in the last episode, I went and looked through the um, Amazon reviews to see what people are saying. And it's all very positive. And this one stood out to me. Um, Someone said, this planner is invaluable if you have a family member or close loved one with BPD. From the self-care assessment to the weekly reflection, along with the checklist to be sure you are caring for yourself emotionally and physically, this planner can only enhance one's life and help to understand your loved one's journey with BPD. This planner gives you hope and understanding. And I I think it's really that was your heart in writing this this book because you've worked with many families and 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 their loved one. And so you kind of understand what, what everyone needs uh, are through this journey. Um, so I, I'm grateful that you've written it. And I know that those who have used it um, are also grateful. And if you you know have a family member with BPD uh, or friend, I mean, it could be anyone in your life in a close relationship. It's just a good idea to to take care of yourself. And this, this wellness planner really helps, helps you do that. So um, I encourage you to get it. I, I just want to thank you, Amanda, so much for being with us on these two episodes. I, I, I think the three of us could talk about BPD for days on end, and it's it's just such a fascinating subject. And and I, I love that you bring this message of hope to it, it because it can be a very dark um, and seemingly ugly situation to deal with. But there is a lot of hope. Uh, there's tons of evidence showing that people get better, that they can um, get out of the diagnosis, you know, if they stick with the, the treatment and, and do the things they're supposed to do. And, and families can heal. They don't need to be divided or ruptured forever. Uh, there's probably a, a big space for forgiveness and moving forward, right? Instead of really staying stuck in the past and some of the behaviors that might have come, in, come out in the past, which can be very, very extreme. So it's a good idea, I think, to remind yourself as a family member to separate the behaviors from the past, um, from the, you know, any, be, any of those behaviors from the person, because this isn't a bad person. This is a person who just needs a little help, um, maybe from a therapist and maybe, and from those around them. It's just a little love, kindness and compassion <laughs> can go a long way and setting limits and setting limits. Exactly. Yes. It's both. It's both lots of love, lots of validation. And we also set limits when when we need to set limits. That's okay. Yes, very good. Well, again, thank you, Amanda, for, for being with us. Um, if you would like to visit Amanda's website, it is hopeforbpd.com. And her books are The Borderline Personality Disorder Wellness Planner for Families and The Dialectical Behavior uh, Wellness Planner for the Person That Struggles with This and Is Improving. Um, this bo- These books will help you. All those links will be in the show notes. And we have a couple of articles in there as well. Um, And I I know you can contact Amanda through her her website. And as a family member, I know Amanda has a great course for family members. And I think she just started a new one very recently. (laughs) But check her website for those and uh, you'll you'll be able to find uh, the next time you can sign up. (music) 
So uh, we appreciate you listening. And if you have any questions about BPD or anything to do with high conflict, send them to a uh, podcast at highconflictinstitute.com or submit them to our website. Just uh, we'd love if you tell your friends about us and we'd be very grateful if you'd leave a review wherever you listen to our podcast. If you are dealing with a high conflict situation at work or at home, keep calm, use your skills, set your limits, and eventually you'll find the missing piece. P-E-A-C-E. It's All Your Fault is a production of True Story FM. Engineering by Andy Nelson. Music by Wolf Samuels, John Coggins, and Ziv Moran. Find the show, show notes, and transcripts at truestory.fm or highconflictinstitute.com slash podcast. If your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, please consider doing that for our show. 